Sure, I helped make the beds, I helped do the vacuuming, and I helped do this, and eventually I did that, and eventually got a little more. Eventually I started getting into the kitchen. So it was a very full time. I was busy all the time. I got my hour-long break in the morning when the nurses were here. But the rest of the time I was pretty busy, you know, keeping things going, cooking, cleaning, shopping, uh, looking after business. The big challenge though is, is the mental challenge, the, the ability to handle stress, to handle all the emotions that one goes through. One of the things that was important for me, for Courtney, and for all of our friends actually, and we had a wide network of friends, um, and a lot of family from a distance who were concerned about us. And one of the big things was that I really didn't have the energy or the time to talk on the phone to people. I really just did not want to have repeated conversations about how we were doing and just all of the details. It was just too much effort. So what I decided to do was to, to do a regular email to friends and so I would do that maybe once or twice a week and I'd update them on what we were doing, how we were doing, what was happening. Now I had a full-time job and that was itself extremely stressful. Full-time job, essentially a full-time job at home. And uh, many of the time I, I had to be in both places at once and you know, that's not possible. But that was one of the obstacles that, and I had to work around that and that was Thankfully, I had a very understanding boss and I had understanding um, fellow workers and I'll say understanding students. Students, I made that clear to students at the start that I, there was times I wouldn't be in the office. I guess another thing that I felt was really missing that really would have helped us um, would have been to be able to have um, my family doctor or some other medical person come out here rather than us having to make all the trips into town. Especially for example when uh, say when Courtney was going for a pain, pain management assessment. You know he was in a lot of pain so we had to go through that whole thing of, of the transfers in and out of the car so many times um, and you know a number of hours away from home and that was hard. I did receive support after Bill passed away with, uh, through my friends and my family, through my church. Um, they say the three most important things in life are your faith, family and friends, and it's true, and especially after a loss. Friends and family support was phone calls, um, uh, email, um, visits, uh, definitely sympathy cards. And uh, I find those, uh, my husband passed away six months ago, just over six months ago. And I really appreciate rereading the individual notes that they sent. And I had family support. And I had support from a couple. Well, one lady in particular who was a, was a, had MS. And this was weird because she, she had a practice of phoning other MS patients. And she used to phone her in. They became quite good friends. They never did meet each other face to face. But anyway, she'd phone sometimes, dream to be asleep, and get talking to me. And she was a tremendous support. And that's very true. She was, you know, there many days she was flat on her back in bed, but she could still pick up the phone. And uh, she was an inspiration, just a real inspiration. I found it very difficult after Courtney died to deal with people's comment how are you doing? I call it the default question. The question that really has no answer and it's a reflex comment by a lot of people. It's automatic. We all do it. I do it. I try to stop myself from doing it now because I know how hard it is to deal with that question for me. So actually a month after Courtney died uh, I had to go to a family wedding in Montreal and I knew I would be inundated with that question. So I told my family, look, just prepare everybody. Don't ask that question. Say anything else. Say, so great you could make it. Lovely to see you. Or, I'm sorry for your loss. 
That is a powerful statement and really come, hits home for a, a bereaved caregiver, I think. Often the person who's caregiver by nature and is the, the, the practical and emotional uh, uh, support person for the, for the person who, the loved one who's dying, may also mean that they're the least likely to accept support. So um, uh, you may have to prod a little bit and really, really get to know the person well. You don't realize in a marriage what your job description is until you don't have the other person. So um, learning to fix things physically and um, looking after the car, getting oil changes, all the everyday things that usually the men do or often the men do, I was responsible for all of it. So in that way it's quite exhausting, but uh, I realized that I can't do everything myself. No one knows how to do everything, so I ask for help. And my husband has eight brothers, so they're quite helpful. It was overwhelming. A lot of things were overwhelming. And all the first steps that one has to deal with after somebody dies, um, you know, the life insurance, the death insurance, the dealing with lawyers and accountants and whatever. I didn't really trust myself in those early days that I was very sharp. I had a lot of what I call brain fog. And I would often take somebody with me to meetings just to make sure I heard everything correctly and then they could help me do whatever needed to be done. And what was it like for me to lose Courtney? I lost not only my life partner, I had a double whammy, I also lost my job at the same time. So I was grieving both things for 25 years. We had worked together and lived together. And suddenly I had to reinvent myself on a lot of different levels. Because the one problem that I had was a big hole in my life. You know, I'd visited her every day, got over to Stanford Lodge and I'd take the paper and read it to her and so on, all of a sudden. When he passed away, um, it was a feeling of relief and I'm not being disrespectful. I think uh, it was a, a loving thing because you could see that it wasn't going to get better. It was going to get in more intense. It was not going to get better. It was going to get worse. I was with her the, and she died in my arms and, and my first feeling, and I feel guilty about it, was relief. Not so much for myself, but the fact that she finally was at rest. And that was, the thing I think that, 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 that I thought back of so often was, I, this is hard to say, the look on her face when she, after she passed away. Total calm, total, and she hadn't had that look for years. But all the lines were out of her face, and she wasn't smiling or anything, but she just looked totally at peace. So I think that that's one of the big issues in the bereavement process, is that it's, uh, it can take the longest time, and, and we need, as caregivers, and as professionals, I think, we need to try to understand that better. I've actually had a recent experience just last week with a friend who is 22 years into being a widow and she said, you know, every June I get like this. I, it's like I'm kicked off my center. I, I feel like I'm in another world. And I found that so powerful to realize that, you know, what is happening here even that long time later? What, what is it, where do we store our grief in our bodies? What does that look like? Some of the people that you deal with after you have to, uh, after the burial, then you have to deal uh, with some of the legal things, some of the papers, some of the uh, challenges. And I personally had people that I talked to on the phone that were I told them they were very unprofessional and disrespectful of me suffering as a, a recent widow. The support and the help that's, and the understanding non-judgmentally that can be uh, provided in, in hearing their story and, and, and hearing about the, the person who, who died as well. Uh, you know, using the name of the person who died is something 
uh, in our society still, people avoid our death denying to some extent or grief avoiding. And, um, and so acknowledging their, their loss and understanding from really getting to know them, uh, who they are and what this relationship meant to them can uh, pave the way for a, a helping relationship. But after the patient dies, we expect people to come back to work in five days. Who's ready? If it's your loved one, if it's your spouse, you might not be ready, you might be ready, but you know, we have to be flexible. So we have to be flexible across the spectrum of caregiving and into bereavement. Mm -hmm.